I felt led and encouraged by several of you to continue the theme on, on end times. And as an introduction, I have a screen, the possible sequence of events that will occur before the tribulation. As you know, the tribulation is a seven-year period where, uh, that's initiated with the signing of a covenant, and it'll be a very difficult period in history. But there are several events that need to occur prior to that. Three of the, the top three have already occurred. Uh, World War I and II, as we looked at a couple weeks ago when we uh, looked at the concept from uh, the Olivet Discourse that pointed that uh, uh, a world war was a signal of the first birth pain. The next two events have also occurred. Today I'd like to speak on the reestablishment of Israel. The rest of that sequence is not necessarily come in that order, but those events need to occur sometime prior to uh, the tribulation period. And I think that since several of them have affected our lives already, uh, many more might uh, affect us in the future. So let's get started this morning. If I were to ask you, how do you know if God exists? How do you know if God exists? What would you reply? Uh, perhaps some of you have given some thought to that and would have an answer to that question. Others of us would probably struggle uh, to describe the existence of God. Perhaps the one argument, though, that most of us would present is that of creation that there is a design to nature. There's something about nature that demands a designer, a, a creator. And we would cite Psalm 19, 1-2, where it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. But not all people, as we know, not all men in our society and in our world, hold to creation as being a proof of the existence of God. Uh, many reject that, and it has uh, prompted a Christian author, Ray Comfort, to write this phrase, and I quote him, you can lead a scientist to evidence, but you can't make him think. <laughs> if you look at the design of creation, there has to be a creator. That's one of the proofs. The second proof has to do with changed lives. Uh, the lives of men have been changed. Has not your life been changed? Can you not uh, examine your life and know the evidence of a God because of, of the differences in you, what occurred in you? When I compare my life prior to the uh, new birth and after, there was a dramatic change. And even over the years, God continues that sanctifying process. And as I look back and compare my life to 20, 30 years ago, how different it is as he continues to draw me and make me more like Christ. So that's an evidence, but the world would argue that's pretty uh, subjective and would not hold that as an evidence of the existence of God. They would say, show me something objective, something more tangible as proof that God exists. Well, this morning, I'd like to suggest to you that Israel is a very tangible proof of the existence of God. It is a strong evidence of the existence of God. And this morning, we're going to look at some prophetic verses that were fulfilled. For you see, Fulfilled prophecy confirms the authority of Scripture, and it therefore proves the existence of God, the God behind of Scripture. In this particular passage, Isaiah is speaking uh, to a group of people who worshipped idols, and he's really uh, poking fun of them. He says, bring in your idols, tell us what's going to happen. And in the center it says, declare the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we might know that you are gods. But the point of that verse is, is that a true God is able to be predictive of the future and make the events come to pass. And so fulfilled prophecy is definitely a proof of the existence of God. 
a true God, has the ability to predict the future, and he also has the power to bring it about. Fulfilled prophecy then shows the power of God in Scripture. Uh, in verse four, or chapter 46, 9, it says, I make known the end from the beginning. That's what God declares. He says, I know the, the end from the beginning. And then he concludes that verse by saying, what I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. It's one thing to predict something in the future, but you have to have the power to bring it to pass. And so fulfilled prophecy shows us two things. It shows us the existence of God. Only a true God can predict things in the future and have the power to have them come to pass. Our next screen as a background, as an introduction to our, our literature or our uh, the scriptures that we'll be looking at this morning, I, I want to just share some thoughts that David Reagan had in regard to nations. And it has an influence on what we'll be looking at this morning. It has an influence upon our society as well. In his book, America the Beautiful, he reveals seven uh, spiritual principles regarding nations. He said, first of all, that God himself is the one who raises up and defines nations and establishes their borders. And that's substantiated by the Acts passage. Uh, that's a verse that was very meaningful to me when we moved out to the Northwest. I just felt a, a calling to go to the Northwest, and I felt that this is where I needed to be. This is where God, this is a place that he would have me to live. Second thing uh, second principle, he says that God is the one who decides when a nation will cease to exist. Again, these are principles of how God deals with the nations. And when he deals with the nations, he has particularly uh, two purposes in mind for each nation. Uh, nations exist so that uh, they might... Uh, allow people to come to know God, enabling them to seek God. And nations also exist because uh, nations are used to punish evildoers and reward those that do right. That's the purpose that God has in nations. And sometimes, though, nations have... Th those are general principles that all nations should uh, incorporate. But sometimes a nation has a, a specific purpose, a a distinctive purpose, uh, such as Israel. Israel has a, has a distinctive purpose. They are called by God to be a witness. I think our country has some distinctive purposes as well. I think we were called as a nation to be missionaries like Heather, to take the gospel to a lost world. That, and that has nearly been accomplished as we looked at uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, at least in the sense that the Word of God is now available to, to most language groups. In that sense, it has been accomplished. But it's an ongoing work, no doubt. And will continue to be an ongoing work up until Jesus returns. But I think the United States was established for that reason. They were also, I think, established to be a safe haven for the Jewish people. And we were very supportive of Israel all over the years. Uh, most administrations uh, have been very supportive of the state of Israel and aided in their formation. And so, but Israel had a distinctive purpose, and that purpose was to be a witness to God. Uh, Isaiah 43 says, you are my witnesses. Uh, whenever you think of Israel, you think of Jehovah God. And so... The nation of Israel is a testimony to Jehovah God, to God. Now, they've rejected Jesus Christ, but they are a witness to Jehovah God, and they are associated with Jehovah. We'll come back to that thought in a bit later. Uh, a fourth principle, God blesses and disciplines nations in accordance with their obedience. We see this comes into play with Israel and all nations. God holds all nations in contempt because of their pride and rebellion. 
And the sixth and seventh principle, God forgives and then blesses a nation when its people repent. And God destroys a nation when its rebellion reaches the point of no return. The thing that surprises me about this list of how God deals with nations is how similar they are to us as individuals as well. He deals with nations almost identical to how he holds individuals accountable. And so, uh, as we go through our study this morning, I think a lot of things are, even though it relates to Israel, it relates to us as an individual as well. And even starting with the very existence of Israel, uh, it is a proof to us as an individual of the existence of God, I'd like to suggest. My starting point as we look at prophecies regarding Israel starts in Deuteronomy. And it's amazing when you stop and think about it. But nearly 3,500 years ago, Moses was leading the people back in, uh, out of Egypt, back into Israel. And he gives this series of slides that I'm going to share with you, a series of, of warnings. And he gives the first prophetic announcement that Israel would be regathered, reborn, reestablished. So let, let's look at this sequence. He starts by telling the Israelites as they are about ready to enter into the land of Canaan, he says in the 28th verse, be careful to follow all the words of, of the law. And he said, if you don't, in the 28th verse 64, the Lord will scatter you. And we find that that indeed occurred. That they did not follow all the words of the law. Jesus Christ was a fulfillment of the law, and they rejected them, and the nation was scattered. We see that actually coming into existence. Then the next verses that follow it are, are equally interesting. Moses said, Among the nations you will find no repose, no resting place for the sole of your foot. The Lord will give you an anxious mind, eyes that are weary. And he goes on and said, you'll live in constant suspense, filled with dread both day and night, never sure of your life. That has been the history of the Jewish people since they were scattered. Uh, they have lived in constant suspension and persecution wherever they went, whatever land they had went to. I think that's a factor in God holding that nation together as a people. You know, uh, my wife and I are Dutch, and while well, Dutchness doesn't mean a lot to me, my great grandfather immigrated, and my grandfather spoke uh, Dutch, and my dad spoke Dutch with him, although he conversed very well in English, no doubt. And then I had a daughter, and now I have granddaughters and a grandson. And six generations later, Dutchness has very little, if any, uh, significance to my grandchildren. In six generations, they lost their identity with being Dutch. But the Jews retained their identity for this entire period of being scattered. Uh, they were persecuted, and yet that persecution was a factor in keeping them united. Along with this persecution, God said that if you are scattered, if you don't obey the law, and if you are scattered, uh, then your land will become desolate. The whole land will become a burning waste of salt and sulfur. That actually came to be. That actually came to be. Uh, we see in Scripture... Uh, that it predicted it, and we have it verified by, of all people, uh, American journalist Mark Twain, who visited the land of Palestine in 1867, and he published his impressions in a book entitled Innocence Abroad. And he said that Palestine was a blistering, uh, naked, treeless land. And he said you, uh, you could go for 10 miles and, and not see any human beings. There wasn't hardly anyone living there. 
And so God really made the land desolate. And I think that he, in his providence, he kept Israel available for a reestablishment. He didn't allow another nation to come in and occupy those lands because it was too desolate. The Jews began to move in back in the early 1900s and God began to bless the land. They began to plant trees. Rainfall began to increase. And with this blessing, we've seen that the Arabs who are nomadic uh, began to move in as well. They took advantage of the blessing that came upon the land when the Jews began to return. Uh, but the land was desolate at that time. He wasn't really, Mark Twain isn't really known for his Christianity, but he makes this comment. He said, to this region the prophecies apply. I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein will be astonished at it. He said, even cactuses don't, aren't friendly to that land. Uh, and he said, nobody can deny that this prophecy has come true. This is probably what Mark Twain observed when he came. Most of the land was desolate. I was speaking to Guy a couple weeks ago. We were talking about how the land of Israel has come to bloom. I've, I've seen uh, an interview in the Golden, uh, Golan Heights where it, you look out over into the land of Syria and you can see just a cutoff. Syria is brown and desolate. Green is Israel. God has actually um, reversed this, um, this desolation and it too was predicted years ago, 2,500 years ago, during the time of Ezekiel, he, he says the desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass. That actually came to be in our generation. The land has been re reestablished. And so we see all these prophecies that come out of Deuteronomy and we're reminded also that God deals with us if we were to make an application of those passages found in, in uh, Deuteronomy, he too deals with us in a similar fashion. We live in a time of grace, we live in a time of love, but if we persist in sin, God can come in discipline, and he does so out of love. Uh, he disciplines those that he loves, the scripture says. But in the midst, this I find amazing, in the midst of Deuteronomy, he points out, Moses points out, even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there, the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. It, it is a, the first predictive uh, scripture that, that Israel would someday be reestablished. And that, that verse was given 3,500 years ago. There are, we seen then the dispersion, the persecution, the desolation, and the preservation. They actually came to be, and Jeremiah's words were true. Though I completely destroy all the nations among whom I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. And he has reestablished the land. And we see in Scripture numerous other passages also validating that God would return the land of Israel, and it has occurred in our lifetime. Uh, we see passages like Isaiah where it talks about the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. There are quite a few Scriptures in, in the Old Testament that talk about uh, a reestablishment of Israel from the four corners, you, you see the first, ex the first time they were taken in captivity, they came back from one nation. But uh, this reestablishment of Israel comes from the four corners. They were scattered throughout the earth. And so we have uh, a series of verses like that. We have a verse in Ezekiel that uh, tells where uh, Israel would be reunited. The south and the north would be reunited in one nation. See, when they were taken in captivity, they were already two distinct lands. And so God, in his, in his, he, he fulfilled all these prophecies. I, I find that just a, a, amazing. And 
Jeremiah predicted that uh, men who talk about uh, coming up from, from Egypt, they'll no longer speak about that. Why? Because the greater event is the miracle of the reestablishment of Israel, where they're taken and drawn out from all of the different countries. And so we have really a proof that God exists. He's able to predict and did predict years ago, and he brung it to fruitation. He brung it into existence. And so we see a God that uh, demands us to, uh, to acknowledge him and who he is. Uh, what does one do with this evidence? Is it coincidental that the land of Israel has been reestablished? Or is it a positive proof that God does indeed exist? And really, if you're a fair-minded minded person, you have to admit that Israel's prophecies are an absolute proof of God's uh, existence. But even in our land today and in our society, we find that uh, men refuse to, to acknowledge that as uh, a proof of his existence. And really, the atheist... Um, the problem with the atheist in accepting the existence of God is he knows that the moment he acknowledges God's existence, then it means that he has to be responsible to God as well. And an atheist really doesn't want to be responsible. Uh, C.S. Lewis once wrote, an atheist problem can be summarized by this. He said, an atheist cannot find God for the same reason that a burglar can't find a policeman. They don't want to. But the formation of Israel is a proof that God exists. And a proof that the end times are beginning to fulfill. And it's the very purpose of the end time is to have all come to acknowledge who Jesus is. And come to acknowledge who, who God, God is. So why has... Why has um, why has God blessed Israel in such a fashion as they have? Uh, some interesting verses found in Ezekiel 36. He said, I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered throughout the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their action. And whenever they went among the nations, they profaned my name. Uh, how did Israel profane the name of God? when they were scattered? That's an interesting question that he answers immediately. He said, these are the, uh, for it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave the land. You see, the Jews were scattered throughout, and the Jews are associated with Jehovah God, and they profaned his name because people were saying, these people are God's people, and they had to leave their land. I don't think I want to be a God's people, do you? I want to stay where I'm at. And in, in that sense, they profane God's name. And so he's announced that he will give them a rebirth and he will bring them back and regather them. And he tells us that it's not for your sake, he's referring to Israel, it's not for Israel's sake that he's going to do this, but for my sake of my holy name. You see, God is going to do mighty things as he brings the climax of history to an end. He's going, to, he's going to invite all people to acknowledge who he is by the actions that will occur. If, if you don't accept his existence because uh, recognizing that Israel and the prophetic uh, verses coming to true, uh, there are other activities that he will indeed uh, show his magnificence in, in the times past. So we find that the existence of Israel is a and is a, is, an, is a proof of the existence of God as well. Now I'd like to change, uh, change gears just a little bit here and point out that, you remember we started the slides by saying that fulfilled prophecy is indicative of the authority of Scripture. It proves the authority of Scripture, and the authority of Scripture proves the existence of God behind the Scriptures. But there's a second element as well, and that is that uh, the power of God is shown in the reestablishment of Israel 
Uh, the power of God is seen when he fulfills prophecy. And we see that uh, from a verse that we looked at previously, that uh, what I've said, that I'll bring about, what I've planned, that will I do. And it shows the power of God. Perhaps you've been involved with Amway, or at least been approached by somebody that has dealt with Amway. Uh, Amway talks about a center of, an, of, of influence, and they suggest that you work your center of influence. A lot of sales organizations do that. Well, God's center of influence is the whole world, and is all mankind and all powers and principalities come under his control. And I'd like to finish the message just by giving uh, quickly going through some screens that uh, showed the actual formation of Israel. And it's not really just a, a history that I'd like to share with you, but I'd invite you as we go through these screens to imagine what God did to bring all of these things into existence, how he brung the nation of Israel, how he took the hearts of all kinds of men in various places and men of high authority and, and, and even was challenged by Satan himself at various times, how he brung this all to fruitation. And as we look at how Israel came into existence and how God was able to bring it into existence, we're reminding ourselves also that the promises that God gives us in our lives, he is able and capable of bringing them about. If he's promised you eternal life, he is able to bring that about. We'll see his great power as we look at how Israel was, came into existence. Let's look at that quickly. I've got several screens and we'll come to an end here. Uh, this man was very instrumental. He was a Russian Drew. He immigrated to um, England, and he was a chemist, and he developed a very essential form, uh, a chemical for an explosives, and he helped uh, win the war for England and, and, and their defeat of Germany in World War II. And as a, as a reward, uh, there was an English po politician that wrote the Balfour Declaration, and it was a promise that Israel would come into existence. Now, so you can imagine, here, here's a, a chemist from Russia, uh, came to England, developed a chemical, and helped win the war for World War I, and he was rewarded with uh, the Balfour Declaration, which uh, did not confer rights, but promised uh, a commitment from England to reestablish the state of, of Israel. Prior to World War I, the Ottoman Empire actually went all the way around the Horn in the Mediterranean. It was, it was led by a caliphate in Turkey, uh, an Islamic caliphate. It was ruled. And this Ottoman Empire sided in the providence of God with Germany. And of course, we know they lost uh, World War I. And as a result, uh, of siding with Germany, this Ottoman Empire needed to be broken up and reassigned. And there were several nations, United States, England, France, Italy, and Japan, met at an Italian resort uh, to actually split up the land uh, in various countries. And decisions were, were made uh, at this resort uh, France agreed to overlook the Syrian mandate, and England was assigned the mandate over Iraq and Palestine. Now, in the providence of God, this, this came to be. Now, France actually split the Syrian um, mandate into two countries, Lebanon and Syria, and they had a dispute with England, and the Arabs began to dispute also because they didn't like to see the state of Israel come into existence. And so part of the Palestinian mandate, the Jordan uh, was, it was created. The nation of Jordan was created as a result of that. Um, 
And so right from the beginning in the 20s, right from San Remo on, uh, there began to be real disputes by the Arabs who did not want to see uh, the land of Israel come into existence. And, and so legal, legal rights and political rights were transferred at San Remo, and they have left, they leave a question today. Uh, despite this international, and it was an international recognition of the state of Israel at that time, and uh, they acknowledged them as a nation uh, and granted, legally granted title to the, to the Israel back at San Remo. But there's a question, what about future decisions by the UN? You see, that was a League of Nations that made that decision. And there are several legal attorneys, uh, international legal attorneys that point out that uh, the decision made at San Remo is, uh, is binding is binding. And we see that uh, Israel was given the same rights as all of these other countries at that point in time. We, have, uh, we had uh, countries like Iraq and Syria. Uh, every, all those countries except for Egypt were given their sovereignty the same as Israel at, at the same time in the same manner. So Israel has as much rights to existence as do Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and, and these other nations. Uh, but the Jews be, are, were really contested right from the beginning, and there were several, uh, several committees that met, and the predominant theme was that they, uh, they being the Arabs, refused to acknowledge their existence uh, the state of Israel and consequently would not negotiate uh, at all with the English who were taking care of the mandate. And then World War I came, or World War II came, and we see that really uh, Satan made an effort to destroy Israel before it even came into existence uh, with all of the Holocaust. But while World War I provided the land for Israel, World War II provided the motivation to return to the land. And we see in 1947 there was even one last ditch effort. Uh, the English were so tired of the conflict that was being uh, generated between the Arabs and the, and, uh, and the Jews that he, they turned it over to the UN. The UN one last time tried to negotiate a two-state uh, solution and the Israelites were willing to negotiate. The Jewish state um, would not be recognized by the Arabs, however, and therefore they refused to negotiate. And so the English pulled out, and as a result, on May 14, 1948, when they left, independence was declared uh, by the state of Israel. And they are the rightful owner of the land of Israel, but, and we, I just included a picture here showing Ben Gurion ben actually pronouncing the day of independence. But immediately after that announcement, the very next day, Israel found themselves being evaded by uh, five nations, Egypt, Syria, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq. And their intentions uh, were made very clear. They wanted to annihilate the Jews. It was to be a massacre. And they, were, they told the Arabs living inside of Israel to vacate because they could come back after two weeks after the massacre and take up their, uh, take up their property at that point in time. When they vacated, that was a refugee problem that was created that has long-lasting effects even to this day. See, the Jews that actually did leave, or the... The, the, Pal the Palestinian Arabs who actually did leave in, in light of this invasion, when they left, they never came back. And so we have uh, refugee camps throughout the nations. We have, there's one in Lebanon, there's one in Jordan, there's one in Saudi Arabia. There's several different Palestinian camps that arose as a result of that because uh, Israel was effective and they uh, were able to uh, 
with the help of, uh, of the international community, although, or international Jewish community, they were able to, to ward off the battle. And eventually, as the tide of the battle, this war for independence occurred, we see that Samaria and Judah uh, were taken by Jordan, and the little black strip down in the bottom initially was taken by Egypt, the Gaza Strip. And that was what they call the pre-67 borders uh, that they speak about today. Uh, uh, that's an armistice line. That's where they agreed to stop fighting. And uh, really, incredibly, there, there's no nation on the face of this earth can, can say that their history has been foretold thousands of years ago. No, no country uh, can say that after 2,000 years their sons and daughters have come home. Uh, no other nation can say, can a nation be born in a day or a nation be bought forth in a moment? That's what God did. He, on, on a day, the, they announced their independence and the birth pains followed their birth. Uh, all of these things God orchestrated to bring about the existence of the state of Israel. And we're reminded as we close the, with an application that God is able uh, to work in our lives sovereignty. If he's able to take all of these factors and bring about his will in this region, is he not able to uh, help us in our time of need? When we come to him and and seek his shelter, is he not able to respond and bless uh, us? Uh, our sphere of influence is much, much smaller, and he's, he is able and capable. And when he promises us eternal life, we can be assured of it as a result of, of fulfilled prophecies that, that God has given the nation of Israel, and an encouragement to us as well that he's a, a powerful God, able and capable of bringing about his will. And so, let us pray. Father, thank you for uh, the land of Israel. Thank you that you've brought it into existence. And we look forward to a time when uh, you will do great things through them, that you'll be a testimony to the entire world about uh, who the true God is. And uh, all men will eventually recognize that you... 